everyone. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Welcome to our second Latinx Ed Cafecito of the spring semester. Um, very much looking forward to hearing from our awesome speaker for today, um, which you will get to know much more <clears throat> in depth as we progress through this cafecito. So uh, to everyone joining us for the first cafecito or the second cafecito this time, uh, super excited to get to engage in this conversation. Shout out to all the students from Education 510, Education 576 from UNC joining us in the Zoom webinar. Any other community member, community leader, community organization uh, member, um, any students, any family members, welcome, welcome. We are live on Zoom and Facebook simultaneously. Um, so let us know in the comments whether you're on Facebook or on Zoom, um, where you're coming from, anything you're looking forward to. Um, also, shout out to the UNC School of Education um, and specifically the minor in education for their support um, in collaborating with us uh, for this season of Latinx Ed Cafecitos. Um, throughout the whole time, we, as usual, encourage, encourage you to engage, quite ask any questions in the Zoom chat. Also, we would love to highlight any of you. So if you want to speak up and maybe ask a question directly to our speaker, you can use the raise hand feature on Zoom um, if you're in Zoom um, and ask a question uh, towards the end of the cafecito and we'll be sure <clears throat> to uh, give you the microphone for that. Um, and if you are on Facebook as well, um, just comment anything, any reactions, any questions that you have, any reflections that um, you think about as we are talking. So um, before we begin, I do also wanna highlight a little bit more about our organization. <clears throat> so I'm representing Latinx Ed, which is a nonprofit dedicated to invested, investing in Latinx leadership and expanding educational equity and opportunity. Um, and we manifest this mission through our work with multiple initiatives um, that really center the positive racial ethnic identity development and also college access for Latinx youth and families, um, while also working with adults, any education leaders, to create inclusive learning environments for our families um, here in North Carolina. So um, I work specifically with the Somos Carolina program, which is our <clears throat> identity and leadership development program. Um, so if at any point you have any questions or you wanna um, follow us on Instagram, we'll be sure to put that information um, so you can get in touch with us um, and follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, you name it, we are there. Um, so again, comment, question, raise your hand. We wanna engage with the audience and our speaker is super excited, has a lot of wealth of knowledge that he wants to share with everyone. <clears throat> so let's, um, <clears throat> sorry, let's go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Jose Cisneros. Um, like I said, I work for Latinx Ed. Um, so I'm calling a program manager. I teach Education 510 at UNC. Um, you probably maybe have seen me before, but I am from Mexico, grew up in Snow Hill, North Carolina, a very small town in the eastern part of the state. Um, I went to UNC, studied history and education, got a master's in education, taught for three years. Um, so really my journey has been all about education. Um, even before I realized that, it was always part of my journey, um, as well as being <clears throat> a first-gen college student, documented in, in my case. So a little bit about myself and I'm excited to share a little bit more about me because um, our speaker and I have known each other for some time. Um, and there's a lot that I wanna learn because I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity, Oscar, to kind of sit down and just get to know each other. Um, but I do wanna talk more about that later on, but I would love to uh, give you the chance now to introduce yourself and kind of share a little bit about who you are and your background. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. It's a, it's a pleasure to have been invited and, and just talk to you all a little bit about my journey, um, a little bit about what happened along the way and, and how it is that I am where I am. So like Jose Cisneno said, my name is Oscar Miranda um, Tapia, um, and I um, am an assistant director here at Elon University in our Center for Access and Success. Uh, my main role here on campus is to serve as uh, the lead for our first generation um, initiative, which was established back in fall of 2019. And so um, I myself identify as a first generation, you know, graduate uh, and, uh, 
you know, I'm also documented. Uh, and today I'm going to just kind of talk to you a little bit about my journey, um, how I got here. And so the story for me really begins, I think, uh, where it was that I was born, uh, particularly because that has played a huge uh, impact on, on where, uh, how I got here. So uh, for those of you who don't know, I was born in Guerrero, Mexico. Um, and when I, when I was about five years old, my family and I, um, we moved to United States um, to this small town in North Carolina called Clayton, North Carolina. Um, this is in Johnson County, about, you know, 45 minutes or so from, from Raleigh. Um, and, you know, I primarily come from a low income background. You know, my parents, uh, my dad uh, went to high school, but didn't finish. Um, and my mom uh, was only able to afford going to middle school. Um, and so I am the oldest of uh, four. Uh, I'm, I have three other siblings and I'm the oldest. Um, and uh, having, you know, been raised in Clayton, North Carolina, um, needless to say, it was just like a, an interesting experience. I say that because uh, of the ruralness that comes with, with that. Um, I, it, it contributed a lot to just kind of how I am, my Latinidad, um, and, you know, what I'm striving for today. And so um, navigating, you know, the education system in the United States was definitely a challenge. Um, and for me, that really much began in, um, you know, when I arrived uh, here, I started kindergarten uh, in North Carolina, East Clayton Elementary School, shout out, <laughs> Explorers. Um, and so, uh, you know, when many people ask me about like, oh, like, you know, do you remember what it was like, when, you know, kindergarten, first grade, like, I don't know about you all, but like, I just remember crying. I just... At that, at that time, I mean, it's, I didn't know the language, right? And so when, when your teacher or your peers are talking to you, um, I, I didn't know what they were saying. I, I was just kind of following along. And even the songs that we like sing, like I'm over here just like mumbling, trying to like catch up. Um, and to be frankly honest, I don't remember much of my, um, my you know, younger years uh, in school. Um, but what I do remember was this one time in first grade um, Ms. Butler, uh, Maria Butler, she was an amazing um, teacher of mine uh, who, you know, I was struggling, you know, with the language, um, but she uh, was my math teacher. And math for me just came to me so much easier. Uh, the numbers is just something that, you know, there was the language barrier wasn't uh, as present there. Um, and so uh, I was a pretty good student, I felt. Uh, maybe she would think otherwise. But um, I remember one time after class, Miss Butler uh, pulling me aside and saying, Oscar, um, when you get older, um, you're gonna be, you know, you're gonna get old and, and you're gonna become a doctor someday. Uh, and me being the young kid that I was, you know, I was like, yes, Miss Butler, like, I love you. Like, I'm gonna do that. And I'm gonna, you know, take care of you. I'm gonna do anything for you. <laughs> um, because I really loved her. And, um, you know, in, and I didn't think much of it um, at that time, of course. Um, it's not until you get older and then you look back that you say like, wow, that really had an impact. Um, and it was very inspiring um, to know that, you know, someone saw that kind of potential in me uh, to become a doctor like that to me. So, um, you know, uh, an amazing profession. Um, but anyways, keep going along, um, going into my third year now in my uh, third grade. Um, and things kind of took a different turn. <laughs> um, this is third grade is, is around the time when, you know, you start taking end of grade tests. And, oh boy, like Miss Weekly's class. Um, so you all remember, may remember when, uh, you know, parent teacher conferences uh, happen. And so um, there was a parent teacher conference that like needed to happen um, between my parents and, and Miss Weekly. And um, it, I, this was a particularly different experience because, uh, you know, my parents didn't know um, a drop of English. And so uh, how are we going to have this conversation between, um, you know, the teacher and the parent? Um, and I don't know if at the time we just didn't have a translator, interpreter, you know, um, but what ended up happening was that I, um, in the third grade, had to translate 
um, for my father who had showed up that day. Um, and I had to sit there and tell my father that I was in danger of failing the third grade. Um, that, you know, I was just not performing um, as I should have been in class. Um, and, you know, that I could just not advance or move forward. Um, and to sit there as a third grader having to tell your dad that this is what's going on in the classroom. It was just very tough. Um, you know, I kinda I kinda get emotional just thinking about it now, um, because it brings back so many feelings. Um, because what happened afterward was my dad being so serious about education, um, did what, you know, something that like I hated for years to come. Um, and that was um he would make me read every day after that for two hours. Um, I'm not sure if many of you know uh, these like uh, EOG prep books uh, called there was this, there was a certain brand called blast off books. And so uh, the teacher Miss Weekly like gave my dad some of these blast off workbooks and like I would have to fill those out, you know, math preparation, English preparation, like reading preparation. Um, and oh my gosh, like I hated it. I hated it. He, you know, he told me to go in my room and start reading. I started reading the Magic Treehouse books, all the all the collections, because I just felt like um, it was a way to just kind of escape from that reality and, and you know be immersed into what was happening in the books. And so um, I didn't like it. You know, there would be times when I remember in the summer when I didn't even have uh, school beyond uh, summer school because I was also having to do that as well. Um, that, you know, my friends would be outside, they'd be like, oh, you know, let's come out, let's go play, let's go do all this. Um, and I would have to be like, sorry, I can't, uh, I have to do this thing, I have to like read for two hours a day. Um, and that continued. Um, I got to my third grade EOGs and I passed, you know, it was maybe three uh, with scores of three or fours and, um, and to my dad, it didn't matter. Um, he was like, you know, you're still going to read. You're still going to keep going. Um, and that continued for several years until the moment that I got into uh, fifth grade. In fifth grade, um, there was starting, I was starting to see some light at the end of the tunnel where, uh, again, math, my, my, my preferred subject, uh, was really um, ed putting me in different spaces. Um, and uh, it, in fifth grade, I had the opportunity to um, to do uh, get into like accelerated um, because the teacher noticed that like I was really good at like my multiplication tables and like we would have all these um, we would have these competitions in class with who could you know complete fifty multiplication tables in you know the fastest amount of time and so I was really competitive. I love that. Um, got to middle school. Um, and it was in fifth grade, you know, that I was then placed into accelerated um, math. Uh, that really set me up for success. Uh, and, um, you know, I took uh, the, uh, the advanced level math classes. Um, I, middle school years, I describe as like my more nerdier years um, because that's where I was like perfecting my craft in the academics. Um, at the same time, you know, I was involved doing like band um, and just kind of getting my feet wet in a couple different things. Now, fast forward into middle high school. Uh, I go into high school um, and, you know, I still wanted to do band uh, and I did do band. I went to West Johnson High School in Johnson County. Um, and so I had an amazing opportunity over there to be a part of the marching band. Um, and then there was this new school that was going to be built um, in uh, Clayton called Cleveland High. It was going to be the new school uh, where we were going to be redistricted. Um, and so I had an opportunity to go to that school. Um, and this is uh, really where, you know, academics was going well. Um, it was in Clay Cleveland that I began to really get involved in a lot more activities. Uh, things that, you know, I would see my peers do, uh, things like football, uh, track, you know, some volunteering here and there. Um, but I would do those things primarily because, like, my friends were doing them. Um, and the classes were going pretty well. Like, it, it, it was a breeze. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, so fast forward my junior year. Um, and we're now choosing classes 
for my uh, my senior year. My guidance counselor brings me in and she's like, you know, Oscar, like, I really think you could take these these higher level classes, uh, this uh, dual enrollment class um, amongst, you know, other classes uh, to to get, put you in a good place for for college. Um, you know, you have really good grades uh, and you're pretty heavily involved. Like we could, you know, you could get to, you know, college um, and and this was a very difficult conversation for me because um, I tried to tell uh, I tried to find many excuses to tell my guidance counselor that college uh, I didn't really see uh, a possibility for me to go to college. Um, I would make excuses that you know I didn't have enough money to go to college, and she would say, "Oh well, we can find you scholarships and you can apply and like all this and that and." And I was like, uh, no, I don't want to. Like, I, you don't know, you don't know me. Like, stop, back off. <laughs> um, and she would just keep prying and prying and prying and like trying to get me to 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 like commit. Um, and I, I I did what I had to do. I like tried to cry, and I was like crying in her class. I'm like, please don't put me in these classes. Please don't put me in these classes. And gosh, she went ahead and, you know, did it anyways. And, and it was also during that conversation that um, she, I had to come clean. I had to come clean with her and tell her like, listen, like part of the reason why I'm applying to, uh, you know, financial aid and, and scholarships is not really an option for me is because I'm undocumented. It's because, you know, I can't apply for federal, state and uh, financial aid. And it doesn't matter how good my grades are. It doesn't matter, you know, how much I'm involved. Like, I'm not going to be able to get that finance, you know, cover those finances. Um, and that really took her back. Um, I don't think she was expecting to hear uh, that situation. And it was really then that she really, um, you know, helped me out uh, and reached out to multiple different organizations. And Pueblo from Raleigh was one of those organizations that then connected her with a scholarship program that was just coming up in Charlotte uh, called Golden Door Scholars. And this uh, scholarship was a scholarship for students um, that could apply for DACA uh, and were undocumented. And so at that time, it was also 2012 when, um, you know, DACA came out. And so I applied, got in. Um, and uh, I remember having to apply uh, for this scholarship uh, one Saturday morning um, when I just kind of got out of bed and said, you know, I'm going to just write my story. I'm going to tell Golden Doors uh, a little bit about my life and just kind of what's happened. Um, and I really didn't tell anyone else about that. It was just kind of me and my guidance counselor. And at times I like wouldn't tell her all the updates that were happening because I just, you know, I didn't, I kind of felt a little hopeless, not going to lie. Um, but time went on uh, and I just kind of advanced to the different rounds, the interviews. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that um, someone had said to me uh, from Golden Doors when I had asked them, you know, do you have any tips whenever I go in person to do these interviews? And they said, just be yourself. And I know that sounds so cliche, but that's what I had done from the beginning whenever I had written down my story to these applications. And that was so comforting that whenever I went in person, did these seven in person interviews, uh, you know, it just worked out. Like, I, told, you know, people that I, this is what I was interested in. Uh, one of the schools that they had partnerships with was Elon University. And at the time, I thought that I was going to go into business. Um, so going to Elon was just like a really good fit. Um, it wasn't too, too far away from home, too, because my parents didn't really want me to um, go too, too far. Um, and uh, eventually, you know, it was around maybe one day or two days before uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, my senior year that I received this call from the CEO of Golden Door Scholars, Rick Elias, who Elias, who was saying, you know, you got into college. Um, and in that moment, uh, I kid you not, like I, I felt like I was not ready to hear those words, um, primarily because I had I, th I thought it was unreal. Like this was the first scholarship that I had applied to. I was not expecting to get this at all. Um, and here it was the opportunity to 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 go to college for free. Uh, I remember, you know, trying to be as excited as I could because I was very grateful for the opportunity. 
Um, and uh, you know, I hung up that phone call. Uh, I went into the living room and went to go tell my mom that uh, I had just gotten a full ride scholarship. And and I don't think for her, she knew exactly what that meant. Um, I just remember her, you know, like going back into the kitchen and and preparing our dinner. Um, and it wasn't um, it wasn't you know this big jumping up and down celebration. Um, and just kind of reflected on it some more. Eventually came, decided to come to Elon. Um, and, you know, yes, for business, but also uh, because I thought maroon was a pretty cool color. Um, and I was like, oh, you know, I'll look nice in this. Why not choose this school? Um, and uh, came to Elon um, my first year here at Elon. Oh my gosh, like it was a challenge. Um, it was a challenge because. Um, while I was prepared for um, the the whiteness that is uh, that that exists at a predominantly white institution, um, what I was not prepared for was the amount of wealth that existed at this private institution. Growing up in Johnson County, I was very much um, you know used to being the only brown person within my classes. Um, I was very much the only person within like honors classes or AP classes. Um, I was the only like brown person in like my football team, uh, the only Latino on the football team. I played football, not soccer. Um, and I was always that uh, quote unquote um, white Hispanic um, that was navigating that. Um, when I got to college, um, I remember meeting uh, other Mexicans um, and them saying, you know, you're not Mexican. You like you've been born here all your life, like, or you, you know, you've been raised here all your life. Uh, you you don't even visit home. Um, and there was like this part of my culture that I didn't realize I had like missed out on things from simple like quinceañeras, bautismos, like all these things that like. Uh, you know, birthday parties, like that uh, celebrations within the Latino culture that like, I just didn't get to experience growing up. And um, when I got to college, it, I really tried to immerse myself more within my culture. Uh, and bringing it back to Elon, you know, seeing people that I just couldn't connect with, because it wasn't until my sophomore year that I began to find more Latinos on campus. My first year, uh, I had a really hard time connecting. I wanted to transfer. Um, I would always say, you know, like the amount of money, the full ride scholarship could not keep me at this predominantly white institution. And I wanted to leave. I wanted to leave because I didn't feel like I, uh, I belonged. I didn't feel like I saw people around me that looked like me. Um, you know, they would wear, they would wear all the, uh, gosh, I always confuse it. The vineyard vine shirts and the, the salmon colored, you know, like all these things. And like, I was like, gosh, like, me and my cargo shorts don't look like these people. Um, and uh, I remember leaving um, one, maybe maybe fall break and, and telling one of my friends, I was like, listen, like I need to go like change like my whole wardrobe. And we we went to this store called J. Crew, my first time ever being in J. Crew. And I spent a lot of money trying to like try to fit in, uh, trying to buy these clothes that would like make me feel like I looked the part. Um, and, you know, I would wear the clothes and it was just like so awkward. Like I felt so uncomfortable in it, you know, like the shorts that go up above your knees. Like I wasn't used to that. Um, and um, regardless of how I dressed, I knew that I still didn't fit in. Um, the people, my peers around me just, they would treat you differently. Um, and I wanted to leave, I wanted to leave so bad, um, but I didn't leave because I began to get more involved at Elon. I got involved with this um, organization called the Elon Academy. The Elon Academy is a college access program here in John, or, uh, at Elon that helps high school students in Alamance County get to college. And so I had the opportunity to be uh, a peer mentor within the program. Um, and this program, I would say in some ways, provided me the purpose that I needed to stay in college, to stay at Elon. I felt like I had the opportunity to be able to mentor other students that look like me, that come from similar backgrounds, um, and I could help them get into college, um, you know, the same kind of help that I wish I had had going through the application process and so forth. Um, and in college too, I'll say that um, one of my biggest uh, one of my biggest role models uh, was the director of our scholarship program. Esther Freeman. Esther Freeman, uh, you know, she's amazing. Uh, she sat me 
down in her um, in her office one day and and was just asking me, you know, like, how are you doing? How how are classes? And and I felt like I um, could be doing so much better. Uh, and you know, I say that Esther was like my university mom. She provided me like the tough love that I needed. Um, and in that meeting, like, I left her office crying because I felt like I could, you know. Uh, be a good role model for those that come after me, for other Golden Door scholars that come after me to come to Elon. Um, and every after that meeting, you know, all the classes that I ever took on, I got straight A's. Uh, and um, she really saw something in me before I could see to myself. Uh, and she would send me all of these kind of opportunities that I could apply for. One of those was the executive internship program here at Elon where you have the opportunity to work alongside a senior staff member um, and execute a project, um, you know, uh, and you get to be in all of these like spaces, uh, privileged spaces, like the board of trustees meetings. And like, you get to see how some of the decision-making like happens. Uh, and so that was really like my first taste of higher education um, behind the scenes. I had the opportunity there to work with one of my long-term mentors, um, Dr. Jean Radigan Rohr and now my supervisor, um, and fast forward, um, got to or graduated from college, uh, first generation college student, big deal for me. Uh, and I had already landed a job doing, um, being, uh, working with Alamance Chiefs in the Alamance County area. Um, it was during that year that I used it to prepare for myself to apply to, um, masters in higher education programs. Um, and during that process, uh, I would talk to Esther a lot, my mentor, and she would say like, have you ever considered going to Harvard? Uh, and I was like, me going to Harvard? Like, nah, like here I was again, trying to do the same thing like I had done with my guidance counselor back in high school saying like, I don't know, like, I just don't think I'm going to get in. Like, I, you're crazy. Like, stop. <laughs> um, but she inspired me. She pushed me. Um, she wrote one of my letters of rec and, uh, you know, long story short, I was able to get in. Um, and once I got over there, uh, my mind was just kind of blown. I felt like I was in this honeymoon phase of my life where I was like, gosh, like, I really feel like I made it. Um, and uh, had an amazing experience over there. Um, the opportunity opened up to uh, to come back to Elon uh, because I had connected with one of my mentors, again, now my supervisor, uh, to lead our first generation initiative. and. When this opportunity opened up, I immediately like hopped on hopped on board because I wanted to be that same role model, that same mentor that Aster was for me. Um, had it not been for Aster, I don't know that I would be here today. Had it not been for that guidance counselor and the many teachers that poured into me, I don't know that I would be here today. Um, so I'm proud to be back at my alma mater to be able to you know serve as that role uh, as that role model, uh, that mentor, that coach. Um, to students and, and help them, you know, achieve uh, heights that probably they never thought possible. Um, college has had such a transformative, uh, it's been so transformative in my life. Um, and I want other students to be able to experience that as well. Um, and this is now, you know, my third, I'm coming up on my third year at Elon and uh, just kind of very excited. Um, and again, Thank you so much for, for allowing me to be a part of this. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to talk to you all a little bit about my story. Well, Oscar, wow. First of all, thank you so much for sharing so much vulnerability, vulnerability in that story because you, you really touched on so many things, I think, that, that were very personal experiences, but like we were talking before the cafecito, very formative, right, in your journey. Um, yes. And at the same time, like I your life connects so much with my life like literally like you were five when you came to the u.s yes i was right. also five like we were talking about earlier as well growing up in rural north carolina so that yeah. i was taking notes because there's so many points you made that i would love to touch on and like dive sure a little bit and one of those was that rural experience not just being a person of color an immigrant but being an undocumented immigrant um what would you say were some of those challenges that you experience not just in school but generally in society living in rural North Carolina and I and I think I have something that I can share because I we have very similar experiences in that case but would love to hear what you have to say 
Yeah. Um, so uh, I'll talk about, you know, some of my experience being undocumented, but also as a person of color, too, because I think some of those things, you know, are very much intertwined, at least in yeah. my experience. Um, so having growing up as, you know, undocumented, uh, you know, a documented individual, also, you know, with undocumented family, like, there was always this concern of like, gosh, you know, when driver's license, I remember a time when, you know, uh, undocumented folks could have a uh, driver's license in North Carolina yeah. and then they did away with them. Uh, and to, I mean, I'm, you don't have to tell me this, but like in my case, like all, all the adults in my family who came, right, like they had it and then they couldn't renew it around yep. like 2008, 2010 when it expired. Right. Right. Um, and uh, that was, you know, that alone um, was was scary um, because, you know, you see police cars or or you you see something about like there being like a checkpoint or something where they're doing, uh, you know, checking for driver's license. Like mm -hmm. I'm thinking to myself, gosh, like what is about to happen? The moment we show up, um, the officer says, you know, what license or registration like what is going to happen um and you know those are very scary moments um you know it's at times like sorry, it's almost like a phobia that i've developed for the police and i and i think a lot of people have different right yes. reasons for that phobia against the police but i literally like last weekend was at the beach and we got stopped and i wasn't driving but just that anxiety was from my childhood, like my mom driving and being like, there's a police behind us, start playing, like immediately, right? Like we just developed that anxiety yeah. that fear. And I wasn't even the one driving, but I was experiencing that, that's like really intense anxiety increase as soon as we like, and I heard, we saw the lights. Um, yep. It's yep. just like, it's <sighs> horrifying to think that as children, we're going through this experience and it's still impacting us, even though like yep. we, we have a driver's license now we have access to some form of documentation but that fear is still very present in our yeah life. i remember this 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 scene always comes to my mind where i'm in the passenger seat you know my mom or dad is driving and they say oh a car is like uh, a, a police car is maybe two cars down or, or maybe right behind us and i'm just sitting there like <laughs> looking uh i'm like looking at the uh the one of the mirrors that lets you see like into the back and i'm like trying to see and uh i'm like thinking oh god like i gotta act normal i gotta act normal i gotta act natural uh and and i'm trying to see but i remember here thinking in my mind oh man they're gonna see that i'm like looking at them and now i'm not acting natural anymore and it's just the, yeah. those kinds of experiences that's how you just don't just don't leave you yeah and that you were also talking about esl experiences like kind of like traumatic experiences <laughs> um in my case like i remember one time i cried in esl and i remember it was it was like kindergarten through second grade we were all in the same class for esl so it wasn't even um different groups for different grade levels it was all in one group um and one time i cried because my sister had gone in trouble for something that i don't even remember but it was just like a really intense situation and mm -hmm. i like in tears and i don't even know what happened but it's just being in that space first of all is like i i felt like something weird but it was like not knowing how to ver vocalize that or verbalize that in any way yeah um, and just feeling different right like because of this language that i don't speak Mm -hmm. And you, you touched upon that, which, yeah. Th there were times when, um, you know, I would get pulled out of class uh, to go do some, like, you know, working on my English. Um, and I felt, like, ashamed, you know, like, from, like, my, my, my other peers, like, oh, well, like, why am I being the one pulled out to go read? Like, am I in trouble? Like, what does this mean? Um, and, gosh, like, when, you, when I hear you talking about the language piece, it reminds me a lot of of uh, an experience that I had where, you know, you, because I was the one that was, could, knew the, the language. I was always the one having to interpret for many things. If, if, if there was ever something wrong with like the house bill or the phone bill or like the light bill, you knew that you were gonna be the one to pick up that phone and have to call. And sometimes the, the operator, the person on the other line would be like, oh, can I speak to the uh, the owner of uh, the Verizon bill? 
uh, whoever you know owns this account, and I'd be, and I would have to sit there and pretend to be like my dad and be like, yes, this is me. Uh, I'm I'm born in '71. Uh, you know, like, and and I just did not like it. You know, even small things like, oh, you want to order some delivery to like Pizza Hut, you have to be the one to place that order. You know, it wasn't as easy as it is nowadays with the app. Um, and uh, gosh, I just. As a young, as a student coming up in that, um, I remember it being tough. There would be times that I would get very like frustrated on my parents because like, like why don't, why can't you speak English? Why can't you like be like everyone else's parents uh, and just like do these things? Um, and you know, why can't you arrive on time whenever like I need, uh, when I'm like finished with practice and things like that. and. You know they have many other responsibilities um and in that time like what i didn't realize was that oftentimes i would try to uh, assimilate assimilate very much the white dominant culture um and a lot of what i was experiencing at the time I, of course i couldn't coin it then but experiencing a lot of internalized racism uh this feeling yeah. that you know i needed to suppress my own identity to try to assimilate uh and feeling like I, you know, just disliked or, or hated like my own identity. Uh, and I, I, I would take it out on my parents. Um, and that I, you know, those are some of the, the harder days. Um, but it wasn't until I got to Harvard actually that I began to take my first ethnic studies course. Um, and it was then that I like was for the first time I had like a, a professor that was a person of color uh, that like was teaching me about the non dominant, you know, narratives, history um, that, uh, you know, that are had within this country and that have been erased. Uh, and gosh, that class is so traumatic uh, because it brought so many things that I had experienced back when I was younger. but growing up and navigating through the educational school system, you don't realize how much it affects you um, or, you know, even what it's called until you have someone along the way to say, you know, this is what you experienced um, or this is something that happens or people experience. Was this your experience? Yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, again, like even going through middle school, high school, like I didn't have people of color that were my teachers. Um, yeah, I think the only times that I did were probably the the times when it was a Spanish teacher, uh, a Spanish teacher that was like a Latino, Latina that could like, you know, teach us Spanish. Um, but other than that, there wasn't many. Um, yeah. And I think like it's like that's a problem. Representation in the teaching force is a problem overall, but especially in like rural parts of the South um, and rural parts in general. It's such a there's such a shortage of teachers of color. Um, yeah. and, I, and I was also in that situation where the only teacher that I knew was Latina was the ESL teacher or the Spanish teacher. Yep. Um, but you touched on this like identity struggle, right? That I think so many of us, especially coming from immigrant households, we go through and so many forces pulling us in so many directions. And, and unfortunately, right, I also felt that frustration and I didn't know how to understand it or how to process it. And I didn't have a space to do that, right? I didn't have people to talk to about it, right? Like also being like the only one in AP classes or honors classes and yep. just feeling very conflicted with my identity of like, I know I'm undocumented, but I feel so much shame about that. Yes. And I know I'm an immigrant, but I also don't understand that. And I'm proud of being Mexican, but I don't know if I should be American or I don't know how to be American. Like, so yep. many questions, right? <laughs> that were always in my mind, but I never actually had a space or the time to just reflect and try to process. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until college, like in your case, right? Like where I think we we go through this journey where we feel like the need, right, to go back to our roots and really connect with them. And for me, that was studying abroad, like with DACA, thankfully, yep. I was able to do that. And I went to Mexico and I was there six months and really just changed my perspective of like understanding myself right and 
And when I was there, it was like kind of the opposite struggle. I was like, uh, I feel American. And I kind of want to be proud of that too, right? Like, I, can, I, can I choose both? Why do I have to choose one? Right. Um, that, it's so real, that, that identity struggle. Um, and for me also, and we, I think we can talk a little bit about this because I think it's such a unique struggle of like coming out as an undocumented person. Yeah, gosh. Yeah. It's, uh, well, go ahead. You mentioned a teacher, um, but can you tell me more about like what was different about the teacher or the counselor? I think that was helping you, whoever you came out to that kind of like led you to that point where you felt comfortable maybe to tell the truth about your undocumented or undoc being undocumented. Yeah, honestly, I don't know that I necessarily felt comfortable. Um, I think it was just kind of like my last card that I could pull out of my pocket and say, here, mm -hmm. you can't get me into these classes and here's why. <laughs> um, and you know, it, I just, I, I felt, I felt scared. I felt scared in that moment. Um, because like, how is she going to take this? Like here I am telling, you know, my white guidance counselor, like, this is, this is what I have. This is who I am. Um, like, is she going to call the police? Is she going to like, you know, like, am I, am I, are my parents now like in danger? Like what is about to happen? What did I just say? What did I just do? Um, and I like, I'm pretty sure maybe I didn't, I was just, you know, like, I was like, you know, please don't tell people like, you know, this is not something um, I'm very public about. And, and she was very respectful. Um, I felt like her demeanor after I had shared that, like really changed um, and really try to tackle it more from like a, a place of trying to understand. Um, and her consistency in trying to find alternatives for me uh, to be able to access college um, just really stuck. Um, but for the first few days, you know, after I had left her office, like, I don't know that I, uh, I don't know that I was, was feeling comfortable, you know, enough to like go talk to her and just be like, Oh, yeah, now we're best friends. Like, ha, ah, let's just kind of move on. Like, it wasn't like that. Um, and there were times when I think I remember her trying to encourage me to apply to this scholarship and do so. And, and I just, I just didn't, I was like, no, like, you know, I, I'm going to get to it when I get to it. Uh, and not feeling like this is really going to be for me. And, and even after I had gotten it, Jose, like after I had gotten the scholarship, um, you know, there was thought about like posting it on like, uh, you know, the school newspaper or, posting it on like uh, the Clayton News Observer, like, mm -hmm. um, but then there's this fear, right? That like, oh, wow, you're, maybe this is not such a good thing and we're gonna draw attention to you. And we're gonna- like Your entire family, like it's that fear. And I right. like, also, we were in that first class of Golden Door Scholars and I, and I think we all went through similar struggles because nothing like this existed before. There was no opportunity full ride for being for undocumented students right right um, and yeah it was like do I how much do I say who do I say it to and and the fear right of if I say too much if I make it about this scholarship being for undocumented students that means my entire family is probably undocumented and yeah, yeah like yeah. how do I celebrate my own accomplishment was a question that I had um at that point um, but yeah, so, so many struggles like internally <laughs> that I think now that I've been able to be in different spaces and be in communities where I can be my full self, I, like understanding my entire journey. And like you were saying, internalized racism is so much part of that journey that we don't even know until we yes. start processing. And it's like that healing process that enables us, right, to unlearn, right, and let go of so many things and, and so many skills that I think we kind of like just develop to survive that don't serve us anymore, like perfectionism and just, you know, straying away from our culture that now we're like, no, like that, like maybe help me survive, but it's not what's helping me in this moment and I need to move forward, right? And I mm -hmm. need to embrace my full self. Um, right. And that storytelling piece, like you're doing it amazingly right now. I think and it's so powerful, right? To have ownership of our own journeys and our own stories and be able to proudly stated and, and and just take ownership of it um yeah but i think if 
we, there's so many things we could touch on. So <laughs> I'm like, where do I take it from here? Um, but I think now moving now into like your profession, like you're working sure. with Christian students. Many, many of them are probably in, in situations that we were in. What do you see are challenges or end opportunities that are affecting attainment, educational success of Latinx students in the post-secondary level? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think it very much, you know, starts with uh, like before you even get into college, right? Everything from the college application process to the financial aid process, like those are two separate things. Uh, and um, knowing that, you know, it, it's not as easy as just applying your junior or senior year, um, that oftentimes it very much begins, you know, your your ninth grade year, your 10th grade year with the classes that you're taking. Um, and unless you're, you either know that, you know, colleges value, you know, those honors and AP classes a lot more than just the standard classes, like you may never advocate for yourself or that guidance counselor may not know that that's like the path for you. Um, or, you know, your parents not even knowing that like, these are the classes that maybe I should advocate for my child to be in, to have the better chance of getting into college. Um, and you know there's so there's so many barriers to around uh, having someone there to be able to guide you through that process i said how like in my uh, experience it was my guidance counselor right that really kind of made it her mission to help me out but not everyone has that kind of uh that person in their life uh oftentimes we have the opposite maybe we meet a guidance counselor that says you know what a four-year university is not for you um you you belong over here you belong you know let's let's do what you uh do what we must uh to get you to graduate and to start working or maybe you know instead of going to four-year college maybe you're going to go to community college instead um but i was so fortunate to have that one individual to say like you could do all these things why not why aren't you doing this uh and you know, once we get into college, uh, it's a lot of, you know, trying to navigate uh, this higher ed system, right? There's things that like, we were just not previewed to. There's terminology that we just don't understand. Uh, things from like office hours to, you know, what is a syllabus to what is a, what is a credit? To what is a, what is an undergraduate? Like what is, I had the other day, I was working on a writing project and I had to I had the hardest time just trying to define campus. Is it a college environment? Is it a college ground? Is it, what is a campus? Uh, and there's so many processes that like that, uh, that you, you're navigating for the first time. Uh, and as you know, many first gen students, we feel this need to uh, have to do it alone, uh, to not reach out and, and ask for help. Uh, we see help seeking behaviors as like a sign of weakness and not a strength. Uh, we very much, uh, think that because we've maybe navigated throughout our under or throughout, you know, middle school, elementary school, high school alone, that college is going to be the same way. Like, and, you know, there's many students on campuses that like have, uh, parents that are very much involved in, in, in their, their college experience. I remember one time being an undergrad uh, and talking to a peer who was like, yeah, like I had my parent uh, edit and read one of my papers. And I was like, oh, wow, like that is so cool how you can just go to your mom and dad and have them read and edit your papers. Like, I wish I could, I could, you know, have those kinds of conversations or, or you know, even going in college, like instead of just uh trying to have my parents be involved involved in the process it was very much more like you know i got this like or i would try to condense things down and not try to explain all the details um because i was like well what's the point of them trying to understand um and uh you know funding is always a challenge too um unless you know that you're supposed to be you know applying to uh to different kinds of funding in in high school um it could be pretty challenging to to, to navigate that once you're in college right and, or having knowing that like fast where you have to apply every so often like uh all those things uh really make a difference and um, there's this always constant feeling of imposter syndrome right this feeling that like i'm not good enough like I, i'm not supposed to be in these spaces i remember even being in the executive internship program a program where i felt like you know i in some ways had 
was able to, you know, dress in these suits and like be in so and so meetings where it was like high quality professionalism and just feeling like, gosh, like this is not for me. Uh, like feeling like I didn't belong, like feeling like I should not be wearing this suit. Uh, I remember one after I had graduated from college, um, being in my first job and uh, it being like pretty difficult to try to just acclimate to the, the life post college and sitting there in my car um, before I go into work, uh, I would see uh, these two Latinos across the street and they were uh, working um, a forklift, you know, in the storage area, trying to like move all these different boxes and things. And and I would look over and say like, gosh, like that's supposed to be me. I don't feel like I'm supposed to be dressed this way going into this job, into this white collar job. Like that's that's what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, and then because I just didn't feel like this career path was was supposed to be for me, um, you know, and and I see it now, like even just within like working here, like I, I, I see um, people working our landscape here at Elon, many of them being Latinos uh, and, you know, uh, youth that like probably not even, uh, you know, in college yet or, you know, maybe even thinking about it. And they're out here, you know, on the grind, like um, you know, working 12 hour shifts, trying to make it work. And, and, um, you know, it's to think that I could have been in those shoes. Um, you know, I really consider myself blessed to have been in this position and, and it inspires me to, it pushes me to, to keep working even harder. Um, it's, uh, it's been a tough journey, but you know, it's, it's been the people that I've had in my life that have made it so much worth it. Um, that have kind of got me through the ups and downs. Yeah, definitely right like that community that family that support we have um is so has been so crucial and i think back then like i didn't even realize how crucial that was for my own success right i was just focused on like the academics right and the yeah. careers, but like now like i've gained such a bigger sense of my own community and my own like journey and how they have contributed to it so yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing all of this. And I think we we have several questions. Um, and I'm gonna start with a question from Briani Gomez, who is in my class. Shout out to Briani for asking this question. And um, she wants to know, were there any spaces at Elon for students of color? And are there any now that um, can support them? Are there any spaces uh, to support students of color? Yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, here at Elon, we have the Creed, um, our Center for Race, Ethnicity and Diversity Education, uh, where, you know, students are, you know, can have a, a, a place to be able to like, come in and, and, and meet other students that look like them. Um, we also have El Centro, our Latinx Center um, here at Elon, where many of our uh, Latino students, uh, whether domestic or international, like, you know, can come in. Um, and even, you know, other students on campus to be able to come in and, and help uh, and learn the English, uh, sorry, the Spanish language. Um, and, you know, even here within our Center uh, for Access and Success, here we have housed uh, uh, the um, Elon Academy, our Odyssey Scholars Program, uh, a scholarship program for, you know, students with demonstrated need. Um, and some of them, many of them uh, being first generation. Uh, my office is also housed here. Uh, so we have, you know, this thing called the Odyssey Lounge where students are able to come in and, um, you know, make some coffee if they want or, or you know, have some tables to be able to work uh, on some of the stuff that, you know, they have to do. Uh, we also have the Village Project, uh, which is a tutoring program out in the community in Alamance County. and. Um, you know, this center is, is, is open uh, for the students to utilize and uh, had it not been for these kinds of spaces, you know, it would be very tough, it would be very tough. Um, I think too, uh, what really helped me was to have peers uh, that I connected with. It wasn't until my sophomore year that I really made it my mission to try to create like a posse for me. Uh, like, you know, first year students that were also Latino, like I'd bring them in and like, you know, let's go get some tacos or, you know, let's go study together. Uh, and there was just this sense of um, the sense of support that we needed uh, to push each other 
um, and you know, like, oh, he's gonna go study, I'm gonna go study too, like, or we're gonna go at the, we're gonna go, we used to call the library just the lib, we're gonna go to the lib, that's, you know, I'll see you there, um, you know, you wanna go get some uh, Kadoba right here, I'll swipe you in, like, let's go, uh, it's the same peers of mine that, you know, I ended up rooming with, uh, and we just kind of had a blast and, and we're able to support each other um, that way. That's awesome. My sister also went to Elon University. And so she she's um, informed me a lot about some of those uh, programs that really helped her as well, like find community and, and find a place to belong. So thanks for sharing that. Um, I think we're going to have some of our participants and students on Zoom ask questions. Sure. Um, and I think they're going to be able to either ask it on video or through the audio. Um, if we want to get that started. Okay, so we have a question. Go for it. Hi, I think it's me. <laughs> so hi, all. I'm Ivana Hansen. I work for the community college system here in North Carolina. And first, I just want to say thank you to both of you for being so open and honest. I think the more of these conversations we have in front of other educators and other people involved, the more we can hope to make some changes. Um, my question is, how do you kind of fight back against the the attitude of, well, you did it, so anybody can do it. And, the, you know, you just need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps mentality that kind of diminishes the work you're doing, first of all, Oscar, that, you know, with first gen students and, you know, the work that needs to be done to kind of make it a more welcoming space for everybody, um, but still celebrating the successes of the people that have been successful. So I guess that's my question. <laughs> yeah. It's a very good question. It's a very tough question to answer too. Uh, you know, I think there's been moments where uh, I felt I've even challenged like my own worth and, and my own accomplishments uh, because, you know, did I land here because I'm a person of color like uh, or, you know, because I'm have been in some spaces like, you know, token tokenized. Um, it's very tough. Um, and, you know, when I'm trying to work with students, oftentimes, you know, it's not so much uh, if there's an opportunity to tell them a little bit about myself, I do. But it's never for the purposes of saying, hey, you know, because it happened to me, this is what's going to happen to you as well. Uh, my approach has always been like trying to first try to develop a, a trusting relationship with the students so much so that like I get to learn more about, you know, their lives beyond just the academics, uh, try, to, try to learn a little bit more about their family, where they're coming from, uh, the different identities that they hold in, uh, the saliency that they have, uh, that those have. And and for me, when I'm working with first gens, uh, it's a lot of listening, trying to understand, not just listening, but trying to understand uh, and trying to pull out uh, some of the strengths that uh, the students I see talking about. Oftentimes they don't think that, you know, they come into college with uh, these strengths that like they've had to develop throughout, you know, their years. Uh, we sometimes think that first generation students are somewhat lacking X or lacking Y, like, but, but they've had to navigate the ed educational school system in so many different ways that they've developed all of these skill sets that I don't think we highlight so often. Um, and in my conversations with students, I'm saying, you know, like, you know, you have a really good way of like using your words and, and talking to talking within different spaces and navigating those, uh, you know, that is that is like a gift and like you're not uh, you're not scared to say what you need to say. You're not um, you're not ashamed. You're um, highlighting those strengths that students bring to the table, um, helping them recognize those um and trying to then connect those utilize those strengths uh to where it is that they want to go um i think has been very helpful for me um you know one of the biggest challenges that i experienced with my own family was me having set this whole standard of like oh you you were the first one to go in your family to go to college you had everything paid for in fact not only that but you also went to harvard and you had some scholarship there too well, as parents, now we're thinking, oh, my second child, my third and fourth child are also going to be doing those same exact same things. And 
And that, you know, that is an unrealistic expectation uh, to have, uh, not even to mention the pressure uh, that we're putting on our children to, 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 to measure up to other siblings. Um, you know, I remember in my brother, with my brother, uh, this thought that like, uh, the thought of going to community college just freaked my parents out. Like, what do you mean you're gonna go to community college? Like, you should be, you know, good in going to a four year school, having these scholarships, doing these things, you know, you, you need to go be, you know, a doctor, an engineer, you need to go be a lawyer, community college and, and, you know, Unfortunately, that is like what society has painted uh, certain paths to uh, to be. And, you know, we need to um, when we're in spaces to be able to educate uh, the Latino community and others about, uh, you know, everyone's own path looks different. Uh, and we can expect to just everyone fall within just one mold. Um, some students need more time to further develop, you know, their career uh, aspirations and, and what it is that they want to do in life. And, and that's okay. You know, that was the experience for my brother. And now he's uh, doing an amazing job soon to graduate um, from Wake Tech. I'm very excited. I feel like in some ways, you know, he, uh, he set, you know, the standard uh, for what it is to, 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 to go to school and also grind, right? To, to, to work, you know, a full time job like that is not anything that I ever had to do uh, in my um, in my college education um, to work a full time job and and to see him having to navigate that um, I'm that much more proud of him uh, for being able to do so. Awesome, thanks for that response, Oscar. That was amazing. Um, and we have now a question from Elsa. Also, shout out to Elsa, who is in my class and one of our amazing interns at Atlantic said. Hey. Hi. Um, so Yaelene and I had to answer this question for our Tecito on Tuesday, and I just wanted to know what key lessons have helped guide you in your past that you want to bring with you in your future? Yeah. What key lessons have I learned? Um, one of the lessons that I think I'm still learning um, is very much this, this idea that uh, that throughout my life I've had X experiences. Um, but and while those experiences have, you know, defined whatever paths I've taken, at the end of the day, when I'm stripped of all those things, what's left? Like, who am I? Uh, who am I if I am not uh, uh, an Elon graduate? Who am I if I am not a Harvard graduate? Who am I if I if I have no degree at all? I'm you know not making the salary that I'm making. Like like what is what what is my character? Uh, you know who have I become because of the experiences that I've lived? Um, and I think so oftentimes we place our worth on what we're doing, what we're accomplishing, where we've been and what we've done, that we forget about like who, exi who it is that we are when all those things are stripped away. Um, and that's been very hard uh, for me to try to, try to really like uh, to think about, right? Because so, so much of my life I've, I've tried to be these kinds of things, but when those things are stripped, what's left? Um, one of the other things that like, I feel like I'll definitely take into my future is this, the power of just like relationships. Um, I, like I said, I don't think I would be here today talking to you all had it not been for me connecting with the different people on campus, connecting with people outside of campus uh, that uh, saw something in me that, you know, that uh, that I developed these relationships with that connected me with other kinds of experiences. It was in college that um, oftentimes we're told, you know, oh, apply to internships, apply to jobs, do X, Y, Z. But very much at this point in my life, I was thinking, you know, the 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 key here really is to to build that network and to connect with different people on campus to get your foot inside the door. Uh, yes, it's it's about your application resume, but more important than that is the people who you know. Um, and one thing uh, that I'll take from one of my graduate school professors who said, uh, yes, it is about uh, who you know, but more importantly, it's about whether or not they know you. 
um, because when those opportunities come by their way, uh, if you are on in their on their minds in their minds, like they know that like Elsa like you're the you know you're the person for this job right here or you know I know Elsa can uh, uh, get these things done because I know Elsa and you know I've talked to Elsa I know about uh, Elsa's dreams and goals and where she wants to be um, but unless I have had that relationship uh, with that individual they may never know my career aspirations and and the things that I want to do. Um, you know, whenever I was meeting with Esther, uh, every Friday, sometimes on Fridays, I would not have any class. So what would I do? I would very much take, um, I would come in here in the Center for Accident Success and just like lounge around in her office. Uh, I'd be like, oh, talking, chit chat, and whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, sometimes I'd be there because like I knew that she would take me out to lunch and that was going to be free and go get some tacos. You know, it was a good Friday. Um, but there was some relationship that was had in those small conversations and those moments that, you know, led to so many other experiences afterwards. And um, if you take nothing else from uh, this conversation, uh, it's the power of relationships uh, that lead, you know, to so many other opportunities. And, and, and it's in some ways, networking is like a, you know, like a second, third job. Like it's not easy maintaining relationships and reaching out to people. And it can be scary at times, too. Um, but there's huge dividends that come to pay off uh, when you've established that network. Um, and, you know, there's people uh, in your circle that, you know, that you can tap in and, and reach out to. Wow, so. thank you so much, Oscar. That, that was beautiful. Um, and, I, and I love that part at the end, right? Relationship building is something we don't value, I think, growing up because we're so focused on other things. But as we get older, right, like it's, it's really what drives us in the work that we're doing and what we, you know, hope to accomplish as well. Um, so I think this is the end of our cafecito. We um, definitely want to connect with anyone who's joining us for the first time or if you've joined us before. We have more cafecitos coming up. We have two more. Um, in two weeks, we have Banu Valladares. And then in a month, we're going to meet with Dr. Sharon Contreras. So be sure to look out for more information about that. If you've already registered for this one, then you should be getting the information automatically for the next ones. Um, and also just really emphasizing how important it is to increase the visibility of Latinx education leaders in North Carolina, because some people think we're not out here, but we're out here, we're putting in the work, we're doing the work. Um, and Oscar's definitely one of those people. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we're gonna post more information. If you maybe wanna contact or reach out to Oscar, I'm sure maybe he would be willing to do that. Um, we'll put all of that information out there. Um, so make sure to follow us on Instagram, anywhere else. Um, let us know um, what, what you want to see, what you want to learn and hear from these cafecitos. Um, and thank you so much, Oscar, once again. Yeah, I just dropped my email in the chat. Um, so if anyone ever wants to connect, uh, feel free to do so. It's just O-M-I-R-A-N-D-A at elon.edu. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you all so much. Mom, dad, I love you. <laughs> and also, also we, the we had today. We actually had I know a, we did it. I was so into the conversation that I was just like not even sipping. <laughs> all right. Thanks everyone. See y'all next time. Bye. Thank you all so much for coming. <laughs>